Okay, so let's just get started. I'm assuming a few people will come and join later. Thank you all for being here. This is really exciting to be in, uh, you know, hosting in-person talks. Um, and this is uh, a joint seminar between multiple entities on campus, Pilos, uh, the new tripod program that we, uh, the government is using, Encore, and um, as well as EC, CSC, HDSI. So this is a, you know, intersection of a lot of programs and it's a fantastic speaker to sort of get uh, that intersection going. So I'm really happy to be introducing my Fuzzle, who is a great old friend of mine. We know each other from undergrad, she is her undergrad degree at Chinese University and then master and PhD at Stanford. Uh, she was a postdoc at Caltech and then joined University of Washington, where she won almost all awards you can hope for from <laughs> her career. She was a teaching award that I used up, as well as best student papers and, and so on uh, and so forth. So without further ado, thanks a lot, Mike. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tara. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I will... Uh, First of all, thanks very much for Tara to host me and organize this uh, on kind of a short notice. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'll be talking about policy optimization methods for control. And let's get started. First, uh, I acknowledge our collaborators, the collaborators that are uh, part of the main work that I will present. Uh, actually, the project has grown since, and we have even more uh, collaborators as we expand uh, the project. But uh, mainly, this is a joint work with uh, my student, U.S. Sun, who graduated recently, and he's now working at Microsoft. And Jing Jing Wu, uh, also a student at the uh, University of Washington, who is also graduated and uh, working at a startup. Uh, also collaborators, Ron Ye from Duke University, Sean Kakade, who used to be at UW, but is currently at Harvard, and Mehran Mesbahi, also at the UW uh, in the aeronautics department. And so sort of the group of collaborators uh, shows the intersection um, of the different fields because Ron is in the CS department uh, and Sean is an expert in, uh, in RL and is in CS and stats, and Mehran is a control theorist in the aeronautics department. Um, and I do those and optimization. So it's like an intersection of different uh, expertise. Um, uh, what's the motivation? So our motivation actually starts from the recent success of reinforcement learning in practice. Basically, specifically algorithms called policy optimization. Uh, these are uh, very popular in current uh, reinforcement learning and specifically deep reinforcement learning, which is when you do reinforcement learning and you put neural nets you parameterize, for example, your policies with neural nets. In practice, they have had a huge impact. Um, at least demonstrated uh, astonishing success in multiple fields. For example, in uh, robotic manipulation, and also the ones that got a lot of attention in the news recently, in recent years, are in game playing. Uh, starting with uh, the DeepMind, Google DeepMind work on the, the Atari game player, uh, that's shown in, uh, in the middle. That was quite successful and beat human players at Atari. And that was in 2013. And then this continued and more recently in 2016, the, probably the one that is most famous is the Google DeepMind AlphaGo player uh, that uh, is uh, pretty impressive in its performance. So in all these areas, uh, and here's a little bit more about it. Um, the uh, AlphaGo uh, player, for example, uh, what's exciting about it, what's interesting is that the uh, game of Go is very complicated. The number of board positions you can have in that game is bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. It's a very complicated game, and yet this uh, method uh, are based on reinforcement learning using policy optimization plus some other heuristics like a really clever tree search, we're able to beat the best human player. The champion of the uh, of the Go game was uh, played five times, if I remember correctly, with the Alpha Go. Uh, uh, player and was and actually the the uh, computer won four times out of five, um, so uh, pretty impressive. And another area is in robotics. The OpenAI, for example, has these very cool demonstrations of a robotic hand. You can see the cool videos on their website um, where they can uh, make the Rubik cube or solve the Rubik cube, and also with similar types of approaches. So these uh, underlying algorithm in these uh, uh, problems is policy optimization. We can say direct policy optimization in the sense that you parameterize the policy space directly and then do some kind of search or updates in that space. 
Uh, the reason these methods are popular, one can think of is that they're very simple to use, often just based on one loss function and its gradient, and you just do iterative gradient descent type of algorithm. Or even uh, simpler, you just update in a zeroth order fashion based on just the loss values, even without gradients. Uh, so they allow rich policy parametrization, meaning uh, you can parameterize your policy, for example, with a deep neural net and still do gradient descent on the weights of the neural net to learn a good policy. And uh, they also are attractive because they act based on the uh, true systems loss. You can define the loss function that you want to optimize and just use the gradient information of that to, to proceed. So there are some features, but probably the most important is its simplicity. There are some features that make these methods popular in practice. However, and this is of interest to those of us who want to do theory work, both in control and in RL theory and in machine learning, that these methods often lack uh, full guarantees in terms of, for example, optimality. Does the policy you find, is it optimal in any sense? Uh, does the iterative algorithm converge? Uh, what are the convergence properties? What are the statistical properties? For example, sample complexity, how many samples you need? And all these questions are not fully understood even for simplest problems, simplest benchmark problems. And in the case of this talk, we are going to look at control theory benchmarks as our benchmark problems. Because uh, even then, work on this problem is, is uh, pretty recent. So we're going to look at control of linear dynamical systems, which is uh, as a benchmark, which is uh, simplest control problem in some sense. Talking about control theory, let's uh, also uh, show a little bit what's the general paradigm in, in control and uh, how uh, control theorists think about policy optimization for control. So in control theory, you would like to design feedback policies often in a continuous space. So that's actually a bit different from a lot of our L setups that your space is always continuous. And uh, generally the system is represented here. So that's the dynamical system, the system block. And here, xt is the state of the system. It can be a vector of dimension n, and it can be possibly hidden or partially hidden. And you get observations from the system that are these yt. These are the measurements. The measurement of the state of the system goes into a, a block called this feedback controller. And the feedback controller is actually the same as policy, uh, plays the same role as policy in RL. And it gives you a control input that goes back into the system. So there's a closed loop control. Um, and uh, the goal is often to design this uh, feedback controller in order to achieve uh, different uh, objectives. So you observe YT and you want to design the feedback controller block to, to get UT based on YT. And that's exactly the, you can think of it as the uh, action based on uh, state observation. Uh, and the goals are typically, for example, in, in control, they are that you want to, let's say, stabilize the system. If the system is unstable, you want to design a, a controller that would result in a closed loop stable system. Another goal can be, for example, tracking. Uh, you want to track a desired trajectory that can be, in, for example, in navigation applications. Or it could be you want to optimize the performance of the overall closed loop system in, for example, the sense of minimizing effect of disturbance on a desired output. So, for example, you can have this DT which is a disturbance and you want to measure this particular signal WT and you want to have uh, DT influence on WT to be bounded or small. And there are different models, for example, DT can be stochastic and then you want the expected behavior uh, to have a guarantee or it can be a worst case over a possible set of disturbances and then you get H infinity control or robust control uh, where you still want to minimize the norm of gain from DT to WT in the system. And so this, this framework has of course been historically vastly successful in many, many fields. Uh, aircraft control, all of aerospace, for example, industrial and mechanical control, network systems, power, energy. And uh, it's, a, it's a, the, the prime paradigm in control theory. Um, okay, so our goal in this talk is to try and understand policy optimization for control, meaning we want to start with a benchmark problem coming from control theory. Uh, and this idea of let's try to use uh, uh, standard control problems as benchmark has been popular recently. So, for example, work of my colleague and friend Ben Recht also has revisited the standard control problems from a more machine learning and statistics point of view as benchmark and try to characterize, for example, sample complexity uh, in that setting. So we are also trying to use uh, control problems as benchmark. 
And uh, that's the benchmark. Then we also want to look at simple algorithms, pro probably the simplest we can get. So for example, we will be looking at policy gradient descent. We'll define it soon, uh, what we mean. And that our goal is to try and give guarantees for policy optimization in learning feedback control policies. And we want to see when would we get the optimal, uh, optimal policy. And this is a good benchmark because control theory already has a whole setup of finding optimal policies based on and given a model of the dynamics. If you have a model, there is very nice uh, mathematical approaches to find the optimal policy. What we want to see, can we find it just by doing gradient descent on in the policy space, which is different than classical control approaches, typical ones. So the big picture is we're trying to, in some way, bridge control theory and reinforcement learning and employ basically a modern optimization perspective uh, we look at iterative algorithms, for example, first order algorithms that are based on gradients or zeroth order uh, algorithms that are based on only function evaluations. Uh, and we are going to try to understand and connect sort of model free and model based views. Uh, I put these in quotes because they're not really that well defined terms, but uh, typically in our L world, people try not to model their systems, it seems, and they really are interested in um, approaches that don't require having a lot of modeling going on. And in control theory, often uh, standard is very much model-based. You first try to model your system. And in reality, the thing is, this is not a dichotomy. In reality, most uh, problems are somewhere in between. You know something about the model and you don't fully know it. So it would be interesting to uh, try to con uh, also connect these viewpoints. Okay, so what is the gradient descent on policy or policy gradient descent? Uh, so consider an optimization problem like this. So here K is uh, capturing our policy, some parameterization of policy. L is a loss function or cost function as a function of that policy. And this uh, curly K is the set of constraints on the policy. So just very high level way of writing. I want to minimize some costs over the policy space. And uh, algorithm, so policy gradient descent algorithm means that we iterate on the policy K, uh, not that K maps observations to action or input space. So it's control and control block in the control setting and policy in the RL setting. So we iterate on that and we use a first order Oracle like uh, gradient of the cost and make an update. So these algorithms look simply, this is the simplest case, the new K, the new policy is the old policy, and you just move in the negative direction, uh, in the direction of the negative gradient with a fixed step size eta. So very, very simple. And uh, one question is, okay, why is it interesting to look at this very simplistic algorithm in this setting? Uh, well, so these algorithms are used a lot. They're easy to use and they allow for many variations. Um, and they also, we can benefit from well-developed first order optimization theory uh, of gradient descent, well understood in optimization. And we can then connect it to the case where you do not have access to the gradient and uh, using derivative free or zeroth order optimization frameworks. Uh, and that gets us pretty close to model free RL that you do not have a gradient work but only can evaluate the loss at different points. Um, so what are key questions? We want to see when does gradient descent on K converge to the globally optimal K star that gives us the minimum loss, globally optimal solution of that optimization problem. And if it does converge to the correct thing, what is the rate of convergence? Uh, and if gradients are not available, can we just use samples of L of K? Uh, and these questions would be very easy if the problem was convex in K. So L was a convex function and the set K was convex. But it's challenging because in general, it's not. And so when it's not convex, in general, it can be hard. So why is that? Well, gradient descent is just a, a picture to uh, illustrate. Gradient descent on a convex loss, let's say convex and smooth differentiable cost, is easy because from any initial point, you converge to the global minimum or the set of global minima. And uh, it's, uh, uh, there's no ambiguity. Um, but if your loss landscape is actually like this, it's non-convex, it's very easy to see. You have local minima, depending on which initial condition you start from, you go somewhere else. And in general, this is a huge mess. You cannot say anything. Um, so before we set up the uh, particular first uh, control problem that you're going to look at, 
Um, this is like one slide kind of sampling of different kinds of literature in this broader field of intersection of learning and control. It's a very big intersection, by the way, and can find all kinds of papers with different focuses. But this is just a few samples. So I would say everything goes back to Bellman. Um, both uh, control theory and RL are based on really Bellman's theory. So they started from the basically a shared route, but they have kind of diverged in terms of the research. Um, so they start, we start from Bellman. There's actually really early and strong work of Berkshire and Sitzigness, or they have a whole book on neurodynamic programming uh, that looks at approximate dynamic programming. Um, and that actually already allows learning and control. So that's the early version of learning and control setup. There's also a lot of other works in adaptive dynamic programming and applied also to RL. Um, there is papers where um, ad adaptive LQR was considered and the, the framework was to minimize regret. Um, and there's also work on identifying uh, an, an unknown dynamics given measurements um, there is work on the one on uh, by Sarah Dean and others at Berkeley is about instead of trying to use model free type of methods, let's first identify our dynamics and then do control. So they combine a robust, a core system ID and robust control. That's also another option. Uh, it does not need to very simple algorithms, but uh, it does have guarantees in terms of computation and statistics. Uh, what else there are? There is also you know, other, other problems, uh, other types of RL approaches like temporal difference learning has been applied to LQR. Um, uh, also another line of work actually looks at online control and puts it in online learning framework by Elad Hazan and his group. Um, so a, la a large set of different lines of work. I would highlight actually two things that are more related to my talk. One is that this one, which is only about system identification, Morris Hart, Benrick, and Teng Yuma, uh, they only do, they do system identification of, I think, single input, single output, dynamical system, linear dynamical system using gradient descent. And so in that sense, it's similar to our approach because they're just applying gradient descent on a non-convex problem, but they work out conditions that actually renders the problem quasi-convex and that allows showing guarantees for gradient descent. Uh, also this last one is uh, from the control community by uh, Martinson and Ranser. Um, it actually uses gradient descent in a control problem. Uh, it's empirically working really well. So they decided to just do gradient descent on, on policy. And the reason they were doing this was that they, were, they weren't just looking at simple LQR, but they wanted to do structured controls. So they had constraints on the, uh, on the policy that made the problem non-complex. So they just uh, went down the route of let's do gradient descent. And empirically it works really well, but they had no theory for it. So, uh, so we can think of our work trying to kind of give theory for such successful applications of uh, simple gradient descent. Um, right. Okay, so in this talk, I will first talk about the linear quadratic regulator problem, a concrete problem that's standard in uh, control theory. The loss as a function of policy is non-convex, but we can show that the gradient descent actually converges to the globally optimal policy. And this kind of result may be unexpected because it's non-convex. However, this problem has a lot of structure. In particular, it relies on, the result relies on these properties. First, coercivity of the loss as a function of K. And next, and very importantly, an inequality called Polyak uh, Loyasovich uh, condition or inequality holds, also known as gradient dominance. And this property really enables uh, convergence to the global optimal with, uh, with a good rate as well. It's a very strong property. It doesn't hold too often, but it holds in, in this case. Uh, also that the sub-level sets are compact and there is appropriate smoothness over sub-level sets. So using these properties, we will show that things work out for the LQR problem. And then we will mention that this kind of uh, study has recently been extended to many other control problems. For example, to robust control, H2, H infinity, uh, state feedback control, to linear quadratic games, to Markov jump systems and output estimation problem. Uh, interesting set of problems that are actually getting like more and more sophisticated. And uh, one thing that we try to do to try and explain what's going on in all these problems, kind of what's the shared structure that enables these results is actually connects to convex parametrization. So many of these control problems have a known convex parametrization that people in control theory know, but how does that allow us to say something about the non-convex landscape? 
So we'll get to that also. All right, so uh, let me go a little bit faster. So the LQR problem or linear quadratic regulator is basically a workhorse of control theory. And it has a long history. It started basically with Kalman in the 60s. This is really Kalman receiving the Medal of uh, Science from President Obama. Um, so he is one of the fathers uh, of, of this field. Uh, and he set up this, one of the first people who set up this problem as well and, and gave a solution. So the dynamical system here is uh, the X is the state, A and B are the matrices that define uh, the evolution of the state, XT is the state at time T, UT is the input at time T, and we start from some initial condition X0. And one setup, one way to set up the problem is that I want to design the U based on X in order to minimize some kind of cost of the system. The cost can be this cost as a function of input. Uh, it's typically a quadratic function of the state. So X transpose QX is quadratic in the state XT, uh, plus U transpose RU, which is quadratic cost on the input. And this is important because you don't want the input required to be very large. This would make the input be uh, smaller. And this is integrated for a continuous time system. By the way, this is continuous time LQR, but we'll talk about the discrete time system also. Uh, so integrated zero to infinity over all times. And this expectation over X0 is that we chose to have the initial state of the system be chosen randomly from a simple distribution, let's say here Gaussian with zero mean and covariance matrix omega. It doesn't need to be Gaussian, it's any distribution with an, uh, um, zero mean makes it easier and then with a given covariance matrix, that's fine. So in this setup, you're interested to minimize the expected cost over all random initial conditions. This is one way to set up LQR. Uh, we assume that A and B are controllable and Q and R matrices that define the cost are positive definite. Uh, and so the goal is that we want to steer the state to zero because this cost is trying to push the X to zero uh, while keeping the input energy small. So that's the goal. And this problem has a well-known solution, again, going back to Kalman and others. Uh, that the stabilizing policy that minimizes the LQR cost is given by a static state feedback controller. So it can be proven that the optimal among all U's will be a U that is actually a matrix times X. And this matrix K star is the optimal policy, is the thing that we have to design. And it actually has this exact closed form uh, in terms of the matrices that defined in the system, B and R, plus a matrix P where the matrix P solves this uh, equation called the Riccati equation. Uh, this is an algebraic equation that can be solved in P. It's, uh, uh, and, and there are nice linear algebra methods to solve it in P once you know the A and B uh, exactly. And then once you solve for P, you plug the P here and you get the optimal solution, optimal control. So what does gradient descent do for this LQR problem? Uh, so, the landscape of LQR can actually look like this. So this is a picture of a cartoon picture of the sublevel sets of the loss function as a function of policy. Definitely not convex. L as a function of K is not convex. So we want to see if there is enough structure still to allow us to converge to the optimal policy, let's say here shown by the star. So the question is, when does gradient descent on loss actually converge to optimal policy? So in a paper we had in 2018, for discrete time LQR problem, I'm switching to discrete time, but um, it's also holds for continuous time. For discrete time problem, we looked at how does L depend on K? First of all, you can explicitly write it down. It's a messy function and it's not convex. Uh, we also checked that it was not quasi-convex or star convex either. These are other nice uh, convex-like properties. Uh, and interestingly, that happens when the dimension of the system is bigger than or equal to three for dimension one and two, actually it is convex. Um, so, so it's not convex or does not have any other nice convexity type structure. And you can actually prove this by showing a counterexample. example. In fact, it's easy, probably also known in control that you can take two controllers, K1 and K2 that are both stabilizing, meaning they give a cost less than infinity but you connect them and the midpoint of these two controllers can actually be on, make the system unstable. So uh, yeah, so the linear comics combination of two stabilizing case may not stabilize and it's easy to create such counterexamples. But what nice properties this function has and as a function of K, one is that it is coercive, which means 
LK goes to infinity as K approaches the boundary of the set curly K, the set of all stabilizing controllers, and that the sublevel sets of the function are compact and the function is smooth over the sublevel sets. So coercivity plus this uh, smoothness over sublevel sets, that's one nice property that L of K has. Um, but also this important property PL that they mentioned earlier, uh, poly switch, says the following, LK satisfies uh, the following inequality for all K in the feasible set, that the norm of the gradient, um, and this should be L2 norm, basically norm of the gradient in L2 norm is bigger than a constant times the suboptimality gap LK minus LK star, where K star is the globally optimal policy uh, to some power alpha, and the various versions of this inequality have different alphas. For example, if one can show this inequality with alpha equals one half, then you get linear convergence rate. Uh, so this property, if it holds for your LK, gradient descent will converge with nice properties. And it's actually not hard to see from this property that would follow because if you're making the norm of the gradient small, as this goes to zero, it pushes your LK to go to LK star. So it directly pushes you towards uh, optimal. So if you have this property, things are good, but this is a very hard property to come by holding for all K. Usually in the optimization literature, this is used locally around a particular local minimum, for example, to give rates of convergence. But in this problem, it holds globally. So um, that allows us to show that global uh, policy gradient descent converges to, to K star. The condition that we need, we don't need one condition, is that our K0 should be a stabilizing controller. So we, if we start from a feasible controller that is in curly K, we will converge to the optimal K. And we can show that the convergence is the best possible rate of, of linear convergence rate. Um, so that depends on exactly this alpha, and alpha is one and half the rate is linear. Um, so for related algorithms, a similar analysis extends, for example, natural policy gradients. This algorithm is actually even more popular than just policy gradient in uh, the RL world. Um, it basically is like a quasi-Newton algorithm where you are scaling the gradient with a matrix that is based on the covariance of the state. It was a variation on gradient descent and this analysis also works for that. So here's just a, a quick picture, a, a very simple low dimensional LQR problem that we implemented. This is the error in approaching the optimal policy normalized and the error goes down as expected. You even see the linear rate here as a function of iteration. So as expected, and this is interesting, these are the sublevel sets of the cost function in two dimensions and you can see the non-convexity as well. Any questions so far? Okay, so yeah, please. Um, yeah, for the natural policy gradient, you were talking about the covariance of the states. So I just wanted to verify that that is like the covariance of the, I guess, state visitation distribution given your uh, current controller. Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, so the question was what, I just, I didn't even go into the details of it, but in natural policy gradient, what do we mean by, uh, state covariance matrix is the state covariance matrix under the uh, current policy. Uh, states visited or called visitation also in RL under the current policy. So for, for the detailed the one, I would, uh, detailed information, I would refer you to the paper on that. Uh, okay, that, this is a very messy looking theorem. That's from our 2018 paper that basically formalizes what I just said. The important thing here is I just wanted to show there's a whole bunch of constants that show up uh, that are problem dependent that, for example, sigma zero is the initial covariance of the initial state. And sigma k star is actually a complicated quantity is the state covariance matrix under the optimal policy. Um, and sigma is the singular value. So you get the singular values of n singular values, one singular value of these matrices show up. R and Q were the matrices in the cost function, A and D are the dynamics. And so you see dependence on the constants that appear depend on these uh, problems. And also they depend on the loss of the initial uh, controller. In some sense, these are natural, a little bit hard to like make, uh, give a meaning to all of this, but it, it's all problem dependent constant. 
And the important thing is that the rate of convergence in terms of epsilon, which is the suboptimality. So the theorem reads as this, if n, the number of iterations is bigger than this bound, the value of the cost uh, is close to, uh, is epsilon close to the optimum. So number of iterations to get epsilon close is log one over epsilon, which is linear convergence rate. Um, dependence on other problem parameters needs to be worked out, but, uh, and um, yeah, but dependence on epsilon is, is very good. So for gradient, that's for natural policy gradient descent. For gradient descent, the uh, uh, constant in front is a, has a messy term also, which I have in here, but the convergence is again, log one over epsilon, depends on epsilon is, is optimal. Okay, this is written down for discrete LQR, discrete time LQR, which was in our first paper. And one thing that I alluded to earlier, which it is that um, essentially in RL, people often do not have access to exact gradient evaluation. So all you have is some kind of approximation to the gradient that you get from function values. Uh, so can one use this theory to say something about that method? So yeah, you can in the simplest way to do it is to just view noisy gradient estimates uh, and plug that in as if they are the gradient. And there are methods to do that based on zeroth order optimization. Uh, so uh, this is in practice helpful and meaningful if we do not know A and B or we do not directly learn A and B and we do not have a gradient oracle, nobody gives us the full uh, exact gradient. Well, we have some ways to estimate, estimate the cost or evaluate the cost as a function of the policy we are using now. And uh, this can be, for example, either you have a simulator that you can run for your system is costly, but you can occasionally query it, or you can actually like uh, poke your system a little bit and see how it performs and see the change of performance as you explore around the current policy, uh, multiple other uh, points and get some estimate of this. So I'm saying, um, I'm setting this up in a very high level way, but again, details can be formalized. Um, so essentially, this, this setup is very close to what people in RL call rollouts. And they basically have, a, you have a policy or action and you can add noise to it to explore the surrounding policies. So there's exploration via these rollouts. And rollout means that you run that controller that you're trying now uh, for some limited finite time. And based on that, you have to estimate your L of K, which actually was an infinite horizon. So there's a truncation error going on there as well. But anyway, that is possible to do. And one can then show that this approach will converge to the global optimum with enough samples. So you can see how many of these poking around uh, at every policy you need to do, how many samples you need to take, what's the length of the rollouts that you do from every point so that your overall samples are bounded in order to converge to the global, globally optimal policy. So we did it in the simplest, simplest way, meaning at center that every policy you just sample around found it in a sphere, um, but this can be improved. There are uh, methods in zero order optimization that do a more sophisticated way of sampling, for example, two point estimates and, and so on. So these improvements have been made already on our original result. You can improve the sample complexity a little bit, but we have to keep in mind in general, these zero order methods have pretty high sample complexity. They are sample heavy in general, but very easy to implement. Um, this also extends to natural policy gradients. Okay, and so after this control problem of simplest control problem of LQR, there uh, has been a recent burst of uh, uh, research interest, which people have, uh, there are different papers looking at different control problems and shown that policy gradient descent actually converges to the optimal policy for all these problems. So starting from uh, continuous LQR, um, that one was done both by us, but also a group of, of Mihailo Ioannovic in USC, uh, they actually did a, a clean and nice study of the continuous time LQR. Uh, our paper, original paper, actually did the discrete LQR, um, and then we had a slightly improved version. Um, but other groups have done other models like risk sensitive control, uh, robust H infinity control, and there has been work on decentralized finite LQR under quadratic invariance. Um, that also, that problem also has similar results. Uh, very specific form of linear quadratic games with certain updates also have uh, uh, allow for optimal policies, jump linear systems, Markov jump linear systems, uh, and output estimation. I would highlight this last one, which is a recent work uh, from MIT. 
because this one is the only one among these problems, and this is kind of, I think, where the research direction is leading, where you do not have a full state measurement, but you have only partial state information. And they uh, decided to just use the output to estimate the state. So it's a common filtering problem and showed very nice results also for that problem. This problem is significantly harder and it actually does not satisfy the PL property. So more work is needed. And then uh, some work that I will mention in the end tries to extend all these that we are working on with collaborators to the LQG problem, which is linear quadratic Gaussian problem where you have only partial state observation and you want to control the system. So control based on partial observations, that's like in progress. That's harder, again, does not have a lot, all of this nice properties, so needs more work. However, one question that arises is, what's in common between all these problems, at least all the top ones before the last one, that made this work? Why does gradient descent converge to optimal policy? So, so far, these papers often gave handcrafted proofs for each problem. Um, and one by one address like things like, for example, sometimes in some of these problems, including, for example, the H infinity problem, the loss function is no longer smooth or differentiable. So you need to extend it to non-smooth optimization um, and use soft gradients, for example. Uh, and then some problems were not coercive and you needed to do something else to handle that. You needed to add a regularizer, for example. So, but in general, there is something shared between their, these proofs, which is they all rely on this PL type inequality in some way, or we can write the proofs or rewrite these proofs to uh, show the connection through this PL property. So can, can we explain why PL holds in all these problems? That would be a, a nice question, kind of unify all these uh, different uh, approaches. So any questions, by the way? Feel free to interrupt at any time and on Zoom as well, if there are any questions. Okay, so this brings us to the role of convex parametrization. So as a warm up, let's go back and look at the LQR problem for continuous time. The reason to look at continuous time is that its form is a little bit simpler. Um, the continuous time LQR problem, which we set up at the beginning, actually has an equivalent form of this optimization problem. So instead of minimize over K, the loss as a function of K, you can write it as this, minimize a linear function uh, of variables P and Z, and then subject to these linear, ma linear matrix equality and linear matrix inequality constraints on the P and Z. P, L, and Z are the optimization variables. So this is a much bigger problem, but uh, in, in terms of size and has additional variables, but it's a convex problem. It's convex in all of its variables. And so we can think of it as, okay, it turns out that non-convex problem does have a convex parametrization like this, where you can replace your cost with some convex function and your constraint set with a, constraint, with a convex set. So it does allow this, that the solution of this problem actually solves the original LQR problem. How is the solution obtained? After you solve this optimization problem, you can set your K star B, L star, P star inverse. That's, that gives you the optimal case star. So we need to ensure that P uh, is invertible. And uh, that does follow, for example, if your sigma matrix here is full rank, which is not a bad assumption. Um, sigma here, by the way, is the covariance of the initial state in our, in our setup. So we can always choose it to be full rank, so not a problem. Uh, okay, and the important thing is not only the optimal policy is parameterized this way, but all policies that are feasible for the first problem, uh, for the non-convex problem, actually correspond to L and Ps that are feasible for the convex problem. So this is really a mapping between the two convex and non-convex uh, spaces. So this mapping LP inverse is parameterizing all stabilizing controllers here, and this is a, a rich classical result in, in LQR. Um, so for LQR problem, this actually allows a very easy connection between the non-convex problem and some other uh, convex problem via really a change of variables. This can be seen as a change of variables with this invertible matrix P. Um, so there's also the, the paper of uh, Mihailo Jovanovic group that looked at continuous uh, time LQR and looked at this particular approach. So um, can we generalize this idea from LQR? How, how general is it? So yeah, to some extent we can generalize it. We can 
Uh, let's look at this is the non convex problem in K. Suppose there exists a convex problem on the on the right hand side. Suppose that the set S is convex, F is convex, um, F is bounded and differentiable on S, and that First, we make this strong assumption, this one held for LQR, for example, that there is a bijection between K and L comma P. So every K here in this set is parameterized by some variables. L and P are the important ones and Z is some auxiliary variable. So either you assume there exists such a bijection or an alternate assumption, which is more general, says that perhaps there is no bijection per se, but you can still show that the value of the cost of the non-convex problem equals the minimum of the convex problem if I add this additional constraint, k equals LP inverse. So here, k is fixed, k is fixed, I plug it in, and I say this new optimization problem with this added condition with variables LP and Z gives me the same value of L of k. If that's the case, and it turns out this holds for many control problems, um, then, then nice things will, will follow. So right now we're just writing the assumptions. By the way, this third assumption can even be more generalized. Essentially, you don't have to have this very particular map LP inverse. It can be uh, replaced by a more general map phi as long as it has nicely behaved first order derivatives. Um, so there is some work in this generalization in a CDC paper we have in uh, with UF. And there's also related work in uh, the MIT paper I was mentioning, Omenberger et al, uh, that um, they has a set, this paper was focused only on output estimation, as I was saying, but it has a section in the paper that also tries to set up what's a general framework for going between convex and non-convex landscapes. And uh, it's still messy a little bit. So both ours and, and the MIT one, I think there's room to like kind of try and clean it up a little bit more. But OK, so what's the result we can give under those assumptions, in particular under either assumption one and two, uh, or more the more general one, assumption one and three. So one was just convexity of the right-hand side problem. Three was the one that said there's this connection that L of K is the, can be evaluated by solving the other problem with an added constraint. And under those assumptions, we have that any stationary point of the loss is optimal. So global solution easily can be found. Your gradient becomes zero, you are at the global optimum. So, so that's pretty strong. Uh, and you can also kind of quantify this. This is just showing that the, the k star is optimal, but you can quantify it by writing the PL condition explicitly. Norm of gradient is bigger with some constant. This still is hiding some constants here, uh, bigger than the suboptimality. And that if your F in this convex formulation had um, was new strongly convex, you get an even better rate. Actually, in that case, you get a, a linear convergence rate because your alpha is one half and your mu also helps. Uh, in the non-strongly convex case, you only get uh, sublinear convergence. Um, so yeah, okay. So yeah, we are hiding some, some constants which would be problem dependent. We can actually work out those constants explicitly, for example, for LQR. Um, I'm gonna skip this one. This is a slightly more general version. You can think of this result that I just showed in terms of directional derivatives. And if you do that, it also extends to non-differentiable cost. Here, we just wrote gradients, but there's a way to think about it that you don't need gradients and you can work with sub -gradients. Um, I guess an intuition in the proof is basically you map, we go back and forth between uh, a convex space. So this cartoon represents the convex space in the variables L and P and Z, and uh, the non-convex space where the variable is K. For nice problems like LQR, you can actually map, for example, gradient flow trajectory in this space to a nice trajectory in this space and actually map the full algorithms to each other. But the result that I just showed was only about the optimality of the solution. That's a more general result. But for some problems, one can even map the uh, progression of the algorithms through gradient flow and then discretizing gradient flow. And actually the paper by uh, Mihailo's group that I was mentioning, Mohammed et al actually does that for continuous time LQR. Um, so one example of things that satisfy these conditions is continuous time LQR, which we just saw. Uh, here I just summarized the A transpose P plus P A transpose by that. This, this linear map as a function of P, this is a linear map as a function of L. So similar to what we just saw. 
And uh, as long as the P is always invertible, and that, as I was mentioning, it can be guaranteed if your X, uh, zero initial state has a full rank covariance, then this mapping LP inverse is always well defined and the result holds. And one can even quantify it by looking at, for example, for an A sub-level set of the cost function, you can explicitly write down the cost as a function of the LP and Z as written here. And you can even, uh, without going into details, just to tell you, we can find problem dependent constants, all the constants needed. Uh, one can work out exactly um, this constant in the PO condition. Uh, which is a mess, but it depends on the sublevel set, uh, the, the value of the loss at K0, uh, and Q and R, which were the problem parameters, and this nu, which is this thing, which depends on the A and B matrices as well. Okay, so one can work out with a bunch of work the, what the constants are, and therefore get the actual explicit rate. So similar story for discrete time LQR, the geometry of discrete time LQR is a bit different. So it's not exactly the same proof. You have to redo things, but the result actually does hold. Um, so in the, in the discrete time, instead of an integral, you have a summation of a quadratic cost and it does have a convex formulation that looks like this. Um, and that we can conclude that this, this convex formulation satisfies our properties and therefore LK satisfies uh, PL. So things are good for discrete time LQR as well. Um, similarly with Markov jump system problem, this problem is like much more messy and needs notation to define, but in the end, actually the math is very similar to, to LQR. You just have these jumps that, so there's a probabilistic model for transitioning between one dynamics and another dynamic. And so this work, this was done by uh, this paper from UIUC. Um, let me go, yeah, the, not go into the details of these examples. This also satisfies PL. Um, we see that how, when there is a convex parameterization, and not only that there is a convex parameterization, but the mapping between this convex parameterization and the original space is a nice mapping, satisfies some condition, then sort of the PL just pops out. PL condition pops out from which convergence of gradient descent also pops out. So it's kind of a nice unifying view, I think. Um, but it also has limitations, which I'll uh, talk about. So, so far, um, what we showed is for a family of control design problems, policy gradient descent converges to the globally uh, optimal policy despite non-convexity. And this convergence also comes with a rate that can be written down in terms of problem parameters. And that uh, there are a bunch of different harder problems for which this holds. Uh, for example, the H infinity problem is a non smooth problem, but uh, H infinity with state feedback is easier. Output feedback is tricky. Um, yeah, but H infinity with state feedback is non smooth, but everything works for it as well. Um, so, a general proof method that can connect the non convex and non convex landscape of the original problem with a convex problem. Um, is essentially using this PL property and the property of the mapping between this space of parameters. So it's a step towards trying to unify what's in common between these problems, why does this work? And uh, this view with uh, going through PL and making this connection uh, uh, extends to related methods like natural policy gradient uh, and helps design and analyze derivative-free versions of these methods. So what I was just saying in the last part was, these are all based on gradient, but we can then go to the zeroth order versions as well. Now challenges and future work. One big one, which I think is actually a, a good research direction is partial state observation. Like the problem LQG linear quadratic Gaussian is a classical problem also in control, but here you only observe, if you go back, if you go back actually to that block diagram we had earlier, you're only observing a function of the state. Okay, maybe that was too early, I won't go. <laughs> um, you observe the YT signal, which depends on the state, but it's not exactly all of state. And that's actually very realistic. In a lot of systems, you're not, you're not able to observe your full state. So what happens in that case is if you're observing YT and you want to control your system based on YT, 
things are significantly harder because your optimal policy is no longer a static policy parameterized by a single matrix K star that we had before, but you have dynamic optimal controller. So your optimal controller itself is a dynamical system that you have to design, um, but it can be written down. You can parameterize the controller itself with its own ABCD matrices and then optimize over those ABCD to find the dynamic controller. And so we have ongoing work with uh, actually Yang who is here, uh, not, not right now, but he's at US, UCSC, uh, and uh, collaborator uh, Nina at Harvard, uh, where we are looking at this LQG problem. And we have some preliminary results. So we have some preliminary progress on, um, well, so the MIT group made progress on the output estimation problem. That was the Omenberger et al. paper I mentioned. Um, that is, if you are not controlling the system, just estimating the state. And they have positive results on that. Uh, and we are working on the uh, controlling using the uh, output feedback problem. So what's hard about this problem is that, first of all, PL no longer holds. This problem actually does have saddle points. Uh, it does not have local minima though, only saddle points. So if you can somehow deal with those saddle points, you're still good. And it does seem like if you do it right, uh, things should be good. So there was negative results shown by uh, Yang and Nina actually earlier about how the landscape uh, does have multiple saddle points and it's not as nice as if you are, uh, but it, these saddles seem to be avoidable. So as you may know, also this uh, came up in other literature where if you have a strict saddle point and you want to get out of it, it's actually not that hard. You just need to add a little bit of noise and perturb the iterate to escape from a saddle. So they all did a lot of work about escaping from strict saddle points. It's because it's like an unstable point and it's easy to escape from. So we can leverage that. Some saddle points are not a problem for gradient descent based algorithm. Uh, so that's that's ongoing research. Uh, and then, yeah, exactly, more complicated control problems that could have saddle point would be interesting. And we have to deviate from this PL property a bit for that, but it seems possible. Um, and the other direction is that actual better convergence rate on specific problems, like making more specific use of problem structure for each case. This was done, for example, for continuous time LQR, as I was showing very well, but for some other problems, it's still not very clear. You don't get a nice rate. Uh, and the other thing is these constants that show up in the bounds, so they have nice control theoretic interpretation as much as possible. That would be also nice to try to give. And so here are some references. I would just point out that actually there is a, this is the work with Yang. By the way, Yang told me he gave a talk in this seminar last week about his uh, uh, work on LQG, both the earlier negative results and, and some new results. So uh, hopefully some of you saw his work. And that we also have a, working on a survey paper together with Bin Ho, Kai Cheng Zhang, uh, Nani, uh, Tom Erbashar, and Mehran Meswahi that will appear in annual reviews that tries to kind of put together these problems in a, in a survey. So with that, I'll, I'll end here and happy to answer any questions. Right at 11, so we have time for one question. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, how big is the gap you think between uh, PLA quality and the uh, existence of common experimentalization? In the sense that we see kind of one direction implication here in the work. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any evidence that the inverse can go as well? That all of the PL properties can be explained by some form of or do you think there's already evidence for the gap? Mm -hmm. uh, I actually don't know the answer. Um, we have only looked at basically examples, so it's hard to say something more general. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, but that's a good question. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. In general, do you gain any sort of alternate intuition from the convex formulation of the problem? Mm -hmm. Um. Well, it enabled the proof, so that's like a big, big role. <laughs> it actually is kind of the underlying reason why these proofs work. Why these non-convex problems on the left-hand side of the slides are not that nasty is the existence of that convex parametrization. The existence itself isn't enough. You have to have nice properties between the mapping between the two spaces as well. But yeah, convex parameterization is playing a very big role there. Um, but other than that, in terms of the form of the LMI, I don't know if it gives us anything else.
Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>